I haven't been running ESNet for 10 years, but only for uh, a little over a year. Um, after that last wonderful talk, I'm firmly convinced that every presentation should have a gratuitous leech slide. And mine is, mine's going to be deficient in that regard. There are a couple of animals, but no leeches. Um, so I'm not a biologist. I'm here to talk about computer networking. And you might be forgiven for immediately wondering why in the world you would care about computer networking. I, I think, actually, the high energy physics community, the HEP community, many members of that community wondered the same thing about 20 years ago. But no one in that community wonders that today. Um, that community hit before any other, I think, um, a wall of data intensity. Uh, they discovered that data intensity actually drives network intensity. And in fact, all of their machines, all of their experiments, large scale, currently in production, and everything in the pipeline is designed around the premise that large scale, high performance, international uh, research networks will exist and will perform almost flawlessly for them. Um, an increasing number of scientific disciplines, of discovery processes, of workflows are hitting the same kind of data wall and needing to make the same sort of transition. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the organization I direct at Berkeley Lab, the Energy Sciences Network. I'm going to um, explain an evolution that global networks are passing through, a kind of inflection point from, from being mere infrastructures for service delivery, sort of silent, quiet, invisible infrastructures to something more like extensions of discovery instruments in their own right. And I'm going to talk a bit about how you can make data move faster in your environment, um, in your home institution. So I'll start um, by mentioning just a few facts about the Energy Sciences Network. And I, won't, I don't want to neglect to say that for those of you at JGI or outside of JGI who know Susan Lucas, We've just hired Susan to be our new deputy for business operations. And actually, her deep experience in BER is a great advantage to us. She wanted to be here today, but she's busy overseeing business operations in ESNet today. We are a national scale network. Um, we're a kind of circulatory system for the Department of Energy. So we interconnect all the labs and the facilities um, with a network that's optimized for science data transport. Um, we offer a lot of capabilities that aren't actually available commercially. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. About $35 million organization, a staff of 40. Recently, we had the great, um, enormous good fortune to get a stimulus grant, a $60 million stimulus and grant, grant that enabled us to, in partnership with Internet2, the organization that interconnects the um, uni research universities in the United States, to build out a new fiber optical infrastructure in the US. And we have a number of websites. Um, we are different from the commercial internet. And here's one of the animals that I was promising. In the commercial internet, um, at the core of the commercial internet, there are millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of little tiny data flows that are generated by um, your going to visit Hulu or YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or doing your email. These may seem big to you. They may seem, for instance, it may seem intuitively that a, a video data flow is a big data flow. But compared to the science flows, they're not. And um, they add up uh, into these nice, smoothly diurnal patterns here that are just correlated with, the, with when people are awake and when they're asleep. So this is a graph of internet traffic at the Amsterdam Internet Exchange. Um, and you can just see it's, it's, it's diurnal. In fact, when I first saw it, I was surprised that anyone ever went to bed in Amsterdam. But it turns out that the graph doesn't go down to, the graph doesn't go down to zero. So there's a considerable amount of traffic in Europe and throughout the internet, even, even in the middle of the night. In contrast, big science data flows may be 10 million times larger than a flow that you generate by going to YouTube. And they may last days and days and days. Um, we call these elephant flows or alpha flows. Um, and they result in a really different kind of aggregation pattern. So at the core of the research internet, um, not only is it very bumpy, um, but, but um, the amount of data that the research internet is carrying at any one time might go up by 50 or 60% because a single scientist um, sets off a data flow that moves transcontinentally. So we engineer quite differently for um, our portion of the internet that supports DOE science missions. Now it turns out that um, in this world, the elephants are quite sensitive, um, but the mice are very robust. And you kind of know this at home. Um, you can have two or three people watching video at the same time. Um, you can be on the BART, and your email can be interrupted by the fact that you go into a tunnel, you come back out, and the email session is still open. TCP, the protocol or the technology that sort of underlies the transmission of data in the internet, is pretty good at dealing with loss. 
But for the elephant flows, um, when, you, when you ramp this um, pattern up to very, very large, long-lived flows with high latencies, and by latency I mean the speed of light latency but between the endpoints, they may be maybe a flow from, say, the Bay Area to Geneva, um, the elephants are extraordinarily sensitive to packet loss. So even a tiny, tiny rate of packet loss, like one packet out of 20 or 30,000, can result in um, you know, sort of a, a crushing effect on the efficiency of the data flow. Maybe it goes down by a factor of 80, which means that the science network has to be uh, almost flawless to accommodate these flows. It must drop no packets. And we can do that in the internet core, and that's fine when, when we um, design and engineer and deploy ESNet. But that has to be true in your home institutions, too, for you to get the benefit of um, the capabilities that we're building. So I'll explain in the last part of this talk a little bit about how you can make that happen for yourself in your home institution. The uh, traffic growth on the Department of Energy's ESNet is about um, twice, the commercial, twice the growth rate of the commercial internet. So this is on a logarithmic scale, the amount of bytes we've been accepting per year since 1990. And it's sort of extraordinary that the slope really hasn't changed very much. We're growing, um, we're doubling every 18 months, we're going up by a factor of 10 every 48 months. And I don't think that will change because the underlying drivers for that growth, this is a roughly Moore's Law curve, and the underlying drivers are exponential. Um, now, that won't continue forever, but I don't, I don't think it will change for the next five or seven years. Our uh, fundamental vision as an organization is that discovery is simply not constrained by geography. So it just doesn't matter where facilities and instruments and computational resources and data repositories and scientists are. It doesn't matter where they are, what device they're using to interact with their data. Geography should not um, matter one bit. It's, not, it's, it's impossible for discovery to be completely unconstrained by geography. We understand that, but it's our, division, it's our vision that it be constrained minimally by geography. And that is beginning to happen in new discovery workflows and processes that are quite interesting. And I'll describe one of them briefly. Um, more and more, facilities funded by DOE or maybe not by DOE are being coupled together in discovery workflows that wouldn't have been possible without the existence of very high performance networks. So recently, a set of scientists, um, including Nick Sauter at the Advanced Light Source, had beam time at LCLS, which is a free electron laser at SLAC, um, to explore um, and to essentially take snapshots, as I understand it, of the catalytic reactions uh, of Photosystem II, to take advantage of the very short pulse times um, on, in that free electron laser. The data that was collected during that beam time, which lasted about two weeks, was too big for the local computational facilities at SLAC to process in real time. And the workflow required real time processing to give feedback to the scientists to adjust the parameters of the experiment. And so instead of being processed at, in real time at SLAC, the data was moved over ESNet to NERSC across the bay in Oakland. That's a supercomputing facility run by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, and, the, and the beam time was successful. Now, what's interesting about this is that during that beam time, the, the border bandwidth utilization at NERSC, which is one of the largest supercomputing facilities in the world, tripled just because of one experiment, one detector, one data acquisition device, and one beam line. Um, so this is, the, this is sort of the NERSC border traffic, the background traffic, the kind of background radiation at NERSC. This is the LCLS-related traffic, and you can see that it bumps up and triples the background traffic during the course of that experiment. Um, and that should be a wake-up call to universities, um, to networks, and to um, those interested in data mobility around the world, that the resolution of detectors, the resolution of instruments, obviously the, there are many drivers of data intensity in the biosciences as well, um, are going to be very challenging. They're challenging to networks, they're challenging to all of us. It's, it's happening now. Uh, a more familiar example probably to this community is KBase, which, is, um, you know, which uses the network to couple together remote resources into a larger virtual entity, not just for the purposes of data replication, data access, but also to create and preserve a single security um, enclave that spans and links four sites um, that, are, you know, s that are spread out all around the North American continent. That's another thing research networks can do that commercial networks can't so easily do is make um, one institution appear as if it's part or an extension of another institution. So it's a service that our organization offers. Networks are passing through um, um, a major transition right now. So in the past, as I mentioned, we've thought of them as infrastructures. 
Um, they're a little bit, in the past, they've been a little bit like the electrical grid 1.0. Not the smart grid, but the dumber grid that sort of just faded into the background um, and, and were more or less invisible to scientists. But in the last three or four years, three critical uh, transitions have occurred. First of all, um, as a result of the stimulus investments in the US, but also similar investments around the world, research networks now have bought and leased the underlying optical fiber that is sort of the, the optical substrate of the entire global internet. So they have access to an enormous amount of, of the spectral capacity that translates directly into bandwidth data carrying ability all around the world. So the, um, we share our optical network with Internet2. If you imagine a piano keyboard, the new 100 gigabit network we built is like one key on that keyboard. It's like C. And Internet2 has C sharp. And the DOE and research university communities in the US can expand onto all the additional 86 keys as needed. So we have the ability to grow very fast, relatively inexpensively. Networks are transitioning from being sort of dumb black boxes for data delivery into, into entities that can be programmed, like systems. So they can be virtualized and reserved and interacted with programmatically. That's new. That's revolutionary. It's really hyped right now. And it's a little hard to know what form this transition will take, but I think it's important. And then finally, campus architecture. So your home institutions, universities all around the world are finally adopting um, what, what is called, what the NSF likes to call cyber infrastructure or IT dedicated for science that's sane and that's very friendly to the transmission of large data flows. And that's a result of an architecture that, that ESNet has been evangelizing for, for years and some visionary NSF grants that are paying for upgrades at dozens of universities right now at this moment around the country. So for the first time, we actually have the ability very likely to move data from one endpoint to another very efficiently. So I like to say that the end result of this is that the network will be an extension of the discovery instrument. It's, it's much more like an instrument than a simple infrastructure. Um, it, in the LHC example, in the, in the high energy physics example, um, uh, the traditional site of discovery has been the detector, you know, the billion dollar cathedral size instrument where the collisions occur and are detected and tracked. But if we back up and look at the entire workflow from a network centric perspective, the detector is generating petabyte of second of data, which is a massive amount of data. Um, it's being reduced by trigger farms that reduce it to a manageable stream of relevant data. The, that data is stored in a computing center at CERN, but, it's, but the discovery doesn't really happen there. The data is replicated all around the world to dozens of so-called tier one sites and then to many more dozens of tier two and tier three sites. So in this vision, uh, in this architecture, it's really a little hard to say where the discovery occurs. It's quite decentralized. It's a little hard to say where the instrument ends. Certainly, research networks and computing are, are critical to the discovery process in HEP. So what's happening in HEP, and I, I mentioned the example because I think it will be a model that's adopted in BER and BES and nuclear physics and fusion and other scientific domains. The network was first seen as a kind of Xerox machine. You take massive data sets and you copy them um, all around the world so everyone could have their own copy of the massive data set. Just in the last couple of years, that's changed and high energy physics analysis centers are actually saying, well, we're gonna, we trust the network so well, we're gonna relax that. We're gonna rely on caching. So we'll just fetch the data, um, we'll cache optimistically, um, we'll assume that we can get it when we need it, um, and we're not gonna get a copy of every bit of every relevant data set. And just this year, even that model, which is, pre which is relatively new, is, is disappearing. And um, the remote processing facilities are just grabbing portions of the data set right before they need it. And those portions can be anywhere around the world. Um, and this transition has been very fast. It's very interesting. And each stage reflects a growing faith in global science networks. So new HEP facilities and, and new experiments, when they come online, they're going to start with this model. Not with, not with the first model. And so they're going to rely on rem remote I.O. on just treating some storage facility in another continent across an ocean as if it were locally attached. OK, so now um, in the last section of this talk, I want to explain how you can make some of these developments happen in your home institution, how you can accelerate data, um, assuming that that is, is relevant and useful to you. But I think it probably is likely to be. And the first thing to know is that um, 
10 gigabits per second, which was the fast lane you know, a few years ago, is now the slow lane. So research networks around the world, not just in the US, and universities around the world have, have made the transition or will, will soon make the transition to 100 gigabit second per second networking. So a half dozen national labs are going to do this in the next six months. Some have already done it. A half dozen universities in California, including I hope you see Berkeley, are going to do this in the next few months. Um, and we're going to start even thinking about multiples of 100 gigabit links. So when NERSC, the supercomputing center managed by LBNL, moves from its current site in Oakland up to a new building under construction at LBNL, we're going to link those two facilities with five, roughly 500 gigabits per second of connectivity, precisely for the, for the reason I mentioned in that third model. This computer, the new computers going in in this building, the new building, are going to treat the local storage, um, they're going to access the storage, um, which will be in Oakland, as if it were local. Um, and so we're ex essentially extending the storage fabric across very, very high performance network links. Now, not every institution, not every network in the world has made this transition. And it's possible at your home institution, the transition hasn't occurred. But it should be possible at most institutions now to move data um, a large quantity of data, like a terabyte of data or so, in roughly the time it takes to just go out and grab a coffee and come back to your office. And this chart, um, which is from one of our websites, fasterdata.es.net, basically shows the network throughput required to move you know, Y number of bytes in X amount of time. And here is, um, here is the throughput required to move a terabyte in uh, 20 minutes. In fact, some institutions, a few of them in the world, can move a terabyte, a 10 terabytes in 20 minutes. And if, if you're not able to get the 20-minute performance, I think you should start to make some noise. Um, there are many ways this can go wrong in, in your home institution. One of the ways is that still, unfortunately, lots of science data flows, big ones, are required to go through firewalls. You may have heard of firewalls. You probably have one in your home network. They're traditional security appliances. They're, they don't perform very well. They're not engineered to accommodate massive science data flows. And given the kinds of threats that the internet is facing now, um, which are quite different from the threats that firewalls were designed to contain years ago, they're not even that effective from a security perspective. Um, and w this is a controversial statement. And when I say it to a group of, of tech people, you know, their hair, hair lights up in the audience. But, but um, I would ask you to, to be part of the revolution, if possible, to carve out enclaves in your home networks that are optimized for science data transfer and take these science data flows out from um, behind perimeter firewalls, OK? The general architectural solution um, is something that we call science DMZ. DMZ is, does mean demilitarized zone. Unfortunately, it's a, mil, it's a militarized acronym that is you know, 20 years old in the networking community. So it means something to networkers, not to non-networkers. It's basically a place between, sort of a place between one, one network or another. Um, I like to call this idea of science DMZ a design pattern after the, um, the great architectural theorist Christopher uh, Alexander. It's not a blueprint for what you must do at your campus. It's a set of best practices and a set of ideas that you can bring together and localize so that it works for you. And it doesn't have to be expensive. There's, there's three basic ideas here, and they're all mandatory. Uh, oh, and I, I should first say that this idea is now widely deployed. It's widely acknowledged to be a best practice. It's deployed by HEP, by Climate. It's been deployed at JGI for, I guess I need to point in that direction, for years and years, dozens of universities. Um, it's, it's now being, this architecture is now being promoted and funded by the National Science Foundation. So dozens of universities are deploying it. And in fact, uh, major research universities throughout Australia are now deploying it. So three components, all mandatory. First is a, what I will call a friction-free network path. So a small number of network components that, it, that will perform in that flawless way I mentioned. It actually doesn't have to be that expensive. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a little safe place in the network that is known to perform well. Um, Maybe some options um, for, some, for some special services that research networks can offer, like dedicated fast lanes, um, guaranteed performance for certain classes of data flows. But even that is not as critical as just having equipment that works. It doesn't drop packets. Um, and this ought to be near the, the border of your, 
connection to the internet. Um, then you need, you need to have some systems that are optimized and designed just to move data. They're well-tuned, they're well-configured, um, and they have tools that are sane and tools that, that can actually help you get your job done. The one we really like these days is called Globus Online. Um, it's really easy to use. You can Google it and find out more about it. There's other tools too, but this is one we like. Um, whatever you do, don't use SCP. Um, don't use, I mean, some, some of the tools you've grown up using reflexively to move data will, will be certain to cause bottlenecks in your processes. So in, in this re-architecture of um, the, the local network, this little re-architecture, proper selection of tools is really important. And then finally, there's got to be some kind of measurement system that's constantly in real time checking to make sure the internet works from the perspective of that system. It's, it's incredibly important for forensics, for debugging, and for just assuring that the performance that you need um, is something you can get. We have a website devoted to um, describing this architecture. You can point your IT staff, your CIO to, it's called fasterdata.es.net. Here's just a little cartoon depiction of the Science DMZ. I'm not even going to really try to explain this, but I think the important point is there's just a few components. It's not that complicated. It doesn't have to be that expensive. I, I do want to mention before closing something about these persona boxes. These are the performance systems, I said, that help you assure that the internet is working for science data flows all the time. Um, it's been a long, hard battle, but we've been involved in evangelizing this idea and many networks and universities around the world are now deploying these. There's about 1,000 deployed around the world. So it's very likely that if you have a workflow that requires you to get data from point A to point B, and you're in point B, point A, or at least some important places along the path, have deployed these personar nodes. And if they've done that, you can actually build, or we can build for you, a little web-based grid that shows how internet data um, mobility, how, what, well, let's say, it shows what the weather in the internet is like at any moment in time, okay? Because these devices are constantly talking to each other and performing tests. And I, um, this one is sort of an ESNet-centric grid, and I think it's got JGI on it, I noticed. And JGI is all green. Green means that we can definitely move more than a gigabit per second in real time, and it's only yellow unidirectionally with General Atomics, which is a fusion facility in San Diego that's having a little trouble at the moment. So if you have a dashboard like this for a workflow that matters to you, you can call it up and just see um, how things are doing. If things don't appear to be correct, you can point your IT staff or whoever is charged with taking care of this directly at the dashboard. And those people are going to be interested in this tool as well because it allows them to quickly debug and identify problems. Um, you know, simple, simple things um, like uh, the failure of a, of a little component, an optical component connecting to uh, a network router or switch can cause a big degradation in data flow. And this tool, the Personar tool, part of the Science Team Z architecture, can help your staff detect that and fix it in real time so you don't even have to, or fix it proactively so you don't even have to bug them about it. So I'm, I'm one more slide. Um, the, the important point here, the take home point, is that the science DMZ architecture is really critical, really critical. And, and you can um, help get a change initiated on your home campus, I think, um, by um, directing the relevant folks to the Faster Data website, um, where we explain science DMZ. When the inevitable security questions arise, you can direct them to a lot of material we have on the web that, that helps explain um, what the objective here is and what the alternative security controls that we propose are. Um, and if you're interested, if you work for a US university, you might be interested in getting NSF funds to pay for this kind of upgrade. Um, and this is a link to the, um, to the FOA that will fund that work. And unfortunately, the, gra the grants that I think this points to is due next week. So it's a little too late to get into this round, but there are, I'm sure there will be successive rounds of funding for this so that lots and lots of, not just dozens, but hundreds of US campuses can um, enjoy the benefits of this architecture. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? I need you to come over tonight and fix my <laughs> house up. Ah, I'm going on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>